Coming up, a former Charles Manson follower finds peace after her escape, and prayer brings a father home to his family for Christmas. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada, and today we're talking about calling on Jesus. Mm. And I love that idea because, I don't know, I know your kids kind of live a little bit away from you now, yeah. as mine does. My son lives in BC, and there's nothing more satisfying for me as a father when I get a text from him or he reaches out and talks to me. And that, I kind of feel like God's that way too. I agree. Uh, it is true. When your kids move away and then they reach out to you for whatever reason, sometimes just to talk, it just, it, it just warms your heart. And I think sometimes we forget how our reaching out to God warms his heart. Yeah. You know? Well, and how accessible he is to us. I think yeah. a lot of people think, oh, you know, God doesn't care. He's not interested. Oh, that oh. is so far from the truth. God really yeah, does care yeah. about you and wants to yeah. hear from you. Yeah. And if there was text direct to heaven, it would, you know, <laughs> but it's it. called prayer. It's it called is. prayer. Right. And now a former Charles Manson follower shares her experience around a man who claimed to be the Messiah. I needed to be loved and adored and respected and... You know, I needed to have a purpose, and I, I didn't have that until I met Charles Manson and family. Diane Lake was a child of the 60s hippie movement. Her father led her on her first LSD trip when she was only 13 years old. That same year, her parents sold their Southern California home and moved the family into a bread truck where they could be free from societal restrictions. It was difficult living in a bread truck with five people. And so I, it was un, I was just uncomfortable. And when I thought what was God's voice telling me it's time to leave home, I talked to my parents and they wrote me a note. The note gave Diane permission to leave her parents and live as she saw fit, even though she was only 13. When she met Charles Manson and family, Diane quickly fell under the influence of the sex, drugs, and mind control he used to manipulate the girls who joined him. I, I needed to belong. I needed to be part of, of this movement, part of a family. It's part of his con that he was able to hone in on whatever a person's weaknesses were, whatever their needs were, and then fill it, provide it. I mean, he was a master at that, and he used it to manipulate. He made all of us, I think, feel individually they, that we were his favorite, that we were loved and adored. Manson distorted spiritual ideas and tried to convince Diane and others he was the Messiah. He would, you know, talk things that came from the Bible or Scientology or who knows where, you know, different, different aspects of, of life and they made seemed like he, he had a, a, an ability to make nonsense make sense. Diane was a devoted follower, giving her mind and body over to Manson's will and desires. You, you don't want to accept the truth. You don't want to accept the truth that, that you've committed yourself or you've, you know, given yourself over to a madman. It's hard. It's, it's, that's kind of the process that I'm going through now is really... Uh, realizing and accepting that I I gave myself over to a madman. She endured physical, mental, and sexual abuse at the hand of Charles Manson and those he gave her away to. At times, it seemed more than she could handle. I was going to jump off a cliff after Charlie raped me. I was really hurt by that, and I, I was ready to jump off the cliff, I just didn't, you know, I, I didn't feel like I belonged there anymore. But I didn't know where to go. As time went on, Manson's preaching became more violent. He taught the family how to use a knife to prepare for Helter Skelter, a race war he said would soon be coming. In order to protect myself or to avoid being killed, I was going to have to kill. But I didn't realize that, and, and was he training us to? To, to start Helter Skelter, to, that we were gonna go out and kill. I, I, I viewed it as a way to, that we might need this information to protect ourselves from, from being killed. 
But a short time later, Diane learned Tex Watson and other Manson family members had taken part in a grisly murder spree, killing actress Sharon Tate and several others. It didn't make sense. You know, these people that I had loved were, had murdered people. There was a certain amount of glee, giddiness, um, detachment. You know, they were almost like, as I remember thinking, they were kind of bragging about what they had done, you know? And that just didn't seem right at all. And, and Tex was, you know, when he first told me, he was like, I did this, you know? Charlie told me, he was proud too. He was proud that he had done this because Charlie had asked him to. When Charles Manson and his family members were arrested, Diane became a key witness for the prosecution. And I was able to look, you know, the girls and Charlie in the eye, and I was kind of afraid going in. It's like, is he gonna have mind control over me? But he showed me his real colors and that, you know, with his antics in the courtroom, that it broke any lingering doubts about my affection for him, for sure, for, for sure. After the convictions, Diane was able to rejoin society and eventually became a Christian, where she found her true purpose and identity. She now says that her survival was only by God's love and grace. Jesus is a servant. He's a servant leader. He, he loves us no matter what, you know, and, and he's there to hold us up with the dirty face and the, the tears. I really feel like he was holding me in the palm of his hand. And, you know, I, I just thank God for seeing me through and that's why you know I want to sh share that with people it, I, I didn't want it to be a secret anymore it was a dark dark episode in American history but I survived I prevailed you know and I want to bring some light into this whole dark era in her book member of the family she says she believes God was with her through it all and gave her the grace she needed to move past her time in the Manson family. Now I really want to, you know, share this remarkable saving grace that I can only attribute to to God. I mean, I've had a wonder, you know, I had a wonderful husband, have wonderful children, you know, great church family. It's only by the grace of God. So I'm thankful. I'm thankful for God. I'm thankful for Jesus Christ as my Savior. Wow, Diane's story is remarkable, isn't it? She lived through a very dark time in history and a very dark time in her own life. Now, she said she had given herself over to a madman, and it was only by the grace of God that she lived to tell it. If anyone knew her back then, they would never imagine who she is today. That's what the gospel does. It actually saves us. The gospel is the good news that even though we are all sinners and all unworthy of being forgiven, that we can be saved. God steps in and he provides a way out and a way to be free from this power of sin and the power of sin to destroy our very lives. Well, salvation saves us from ourselves too, doesn't it? It saves us from being controlled by sin and it sets us free to love God and to love others. Listen to what Romans says about what happens to you when you receive the gift of God in your life. Romans 6, 20 to 23 says it this way. When we were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. See, this is the gospel. When you accept this free gift of God by putting your faith in Jesus as the leader of your life, you're set free from the power that sin used to have on you. You used to be a slave to it. You were powerless actually to do right. 
it only led, leads to shame and regret. But now the Bible says you have the power to be free from sin and to no longer be controlled by it. This is the freedom that we find in following God. If you need a resource, that helps you from your painful past, we have one called Freedom or Overcoming Guilt. Why don't you call us today, 1-855-759-0700. You can be free from shame and guilt. Well, after the break, see how prayer brought Rich home for the holidays after a severe accident. Spend this Christmas with family, the CBN family, right in your own home. We're celebrating the holidays. Enjoy the scenes and sounds of the season from around the world. Thanks for joining me in Bethlehem today. To the kitchen. Merry Christmas. <laughs> We're making holiday memories with the warmth and love of Christmas. I hope you're getting in the holiday spirit. It's a CBN family Christmas from our family to yours. Get the app or visit CBNFamily.com. Tuesday afternoon, September 20th, 2016. Nicole Peterson had just gotten a call that her husband, Rich, was taken to the hospital. Then, she drove up to the scene of an accident. Police stopped me and they were like, ma'am, you can't drive through this road. And I just kind of froze. And I said, but that's my husband's motorcycle. He said, um, you need to go to the hospital. Your husband has been in a motorcycle accident. An oncoming car had turned into Rich's lane crashing into his motorcycle and throwing Rich across the hood and onto the pavement. He was not wearing a helmet. Rich was still in the ER when Nicole got to the hospital. A chaplain gave her an update. She came out and took my son and I in a private room and told us it didn't look very good. I heard what she was saying, I just couldn't process it. And when she walked out, I remember I hit the ground and I was like, God, I can't do this. I cannot go through this. He had a severe traumatic brain injury, which uh, left him uh, unresponsive, comatose. Trauma critical care surgeon, Dr. Amy Kohler. He also had significant left-sided chest injury, punctured lung on the left, which dropped his left lung. He also had a injury to the spleen, and it was a grade three to four out of five. And so that's a significant splenic injury. At the moment that I saw him, I was afraid because I didn't know what the future was going to hold. Is he going to make it? Am I going to be a single mom? Am I going to be able to pay the bills? So I know that I just kept really relying on God at that point because I didn't have any answers. The news spread quickly that Rich needed prayer. And when we walked back out into the waiting room of the emergency room, there was like 20 to 25 people from our church. Over the course of the evening, Rich showed no signs of improvement. Doctors could offer no encouragement. With severe traumatic brain injuries, your life is in peril because you're unconscious and sometimes the injury is so severe that you don't ever wake up or you progress to the point of brain death. By midnight, church leaders had organized a special prayer service at their church. Dozens more had crowded into the waiting room. I was just really crying out, God, take care of him, you know, because I didn't know everything that was wrong with him, but God did. In the following days, doctors kept Rich in a medically induced coma and monitored him closely for possible complications. One of the initial significant issues besides the head injury was a significant injury to the chest wall and the underlying lung. And so a lot of those patients develop significant pneumonias and they can't progress on the ventilator and infection can lead to death. Meanwhile, prayer chains were spreading around the world. As for Nicole, she stayed by her husband's side, except when it was time for church. And people started questioning, well, why aren't you at the hospital? Why are you at church? And I would tell people, I'm not gonna let the devil take one more thing from me. I'm coming and I'm worshiping the King of Kings and I'm worshiping the great healer. And I just really believed when I was at the church honoring God, that God was going to take care of my husband. Doctors tried a couple of times to wake Rich up, but his brain pressure and heart rate would spike, so they kept him in a coma. It was a really, really scary time. And I really believe that that's what got me through many dark, dark days. Knowing that the church was praying, knowing that the body of Christ was praying for me and praying for my kids and praying for Rich. Over the next couple weeks, Rich showed signs of improvement. His spleen and ribs were healing and doctors were able to bring him out of his coma. But now they worried he had suffered permanent brain damage. When he came around, 
he didn't remember anybody. And that was, that was really scary because it was like, God, what am I gonna do? I, I, I'm gonna be living with this guy who doesn't know who we are. It was like, God, I thought he was getting better and now I'm getting hit with more stuff. Why isn't this, why isn't this ending? The only thing anyone could do was wait, watch and pray. And it was probably a good three days before he really started remembering who anybody really was. And when he knew who I was, it was just like, okay, this is gonna be fine. We're, go we're going to make it through this. And it was almost like those butterflies again when we first started dating, like, I've got him, I've got my guy. When he was strong enough, Rich was sent to rehab. He pushed through, determined to make it home for the Christmas holidays. The recovery process was long, it was hard, it was aggressive. Um, but my will to do it was everything to me. I wanted to do this. I wanted to be the husband again, the father again, the friend again, um, to be the word of what I've been blessed with to others, to show that this power of prayer works. Late November, Rich was released to go home. Plenty of time to celebrate the holidays and cook his traditional family breakfast. Having Rich come home around Christmas, you know, it really brought in the feeling of family and that God had kept our family together. And when he got to cook breakfast, it was like, well, this is normal. <laughs> Other than the loss of some hearing in his left ear, Rich has had no long-term effects from the accident. Shortly after my recovery of healing my body and my memory, I started recognizing how much mercy and grace was given to me by my God. I was thanking God for his blessing that was placed upon me. It doesn't matter how little your prayer is, because there were times I couldn't pray, and there were times it was like, all I could do was call on the name of Jesus, and I would just say, Jesus. God heard the cries of the church. God heard the cries of the people, and really responded and showed who he was at that point. And to know that I'm still alive with head injuries, lung injuries, rib injuries, body injuries, and what I went through, my God is a healer of all things, and prayer is real, absolutely. You know, I've learned that the process of healing and the way that God provides for us is not always the way we would like. Nicole and Rich's story is a powerful reminder of the comfort of God even when the journey doesn't make sense. I mean, from the traumatic accident to the long road of physical recovery and the initial memory loss, God was present with them. And it was only when they looked back at the journey and the miraculous recovery that the thread of provision became clear to them. You know, Psalm 23, verse 4, speaking of God as our good shepherd, it says this, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So here's the question. Why would a good shepherd lead his sheep through a dark valley? Like, why would he subject them to possible danger, fear? The reason is because on the other side of that valley is something better. A good shepherd knows that if the journey is to green pasture and that valley is there, he will lead them through it. And we can find comfort. It says his rod and his staff will comfort me. Now, again, just stop and think about that. Do those instill comfort to you when you think of rods and staffs? Not really, but it is a comfort because when a sheep would come to a dangerous precipice or a cliff, that rod or that hook would bring them back to safety. Or when there was animals uh, that would threaten them, wolves or other dangerous beasts that would try to consume them, that rod would protect them. Here's the point. When, when we're going through difficulty, we can be confident that God is with us as our protector and as our savior to pull us back and keep us on the right track. And the only reason we're going through the valley is because there's something better ahead. So don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Trust God in whatever you're going through right now because I promise you, he's taking you to a better place. He is because he loves you. Well, have you ever wondered why we decorate Christmas trees? Well, Ace Collins, again, has the answer.
So Ace and a lot of families, you know, including my own, Christmas really starts when you come out to a lot like this one and you buy a fresh cut tree. At what point in history did someone say, you know that nice 10 foot tree out in the woods? Let's bring that and put it in the living room. Long before they were Christians, Vikings looked at these trees and they said they were beautiful and they represented something that was alive in the, in the midst of winter. So they brought them in for superstitious reasons. Mm. Then when the missionaries got to the Vikings and, and transformed these people into Christians, they transformed the symbol of the tree as well into something that provided them with the symbol of everlasting life faith that would never die. Now I understand the first Christmas trees were decorated with things like fruit and nuts and berries, that sort of thing. Whatever the locale had, a lot of homemade ornaments by children. Uh, then Martin Luther was walking through the woods one night, looked up through the pine trees and saw the light coming through the woods. He thought this must have been what it was like on the very first Christmas. He went back home and tried to give that experience to his children by tying a candle onto the tree and having them look at the candle light coming through. And when they did, he explained to them that that light that came to the world, that dark world 2,000 years ago, represented Christ. Are there other Christian symbols associated with the Christmas tree? Long before it was a Christmas tree, the Christmas tree was a track. Missionaries used it like Boniface, one of the legendary missionaries in Europe, used it to represent the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, because the Christmas tree or the pine tree is shaped like a triangle the perfect triangle as he called it. And the first Christmas trees, by the way, if you think you've got a lot of trouble sitting this tree up on the floor, for 250 years, Christmas trees were hung upside down from the ceiling until Martin Luther and others put really? them on the floor, yes. Now also, we're in a lot with fresh cut trees. A lot of people have artificial trees. I've I always figured artificial trees came about in the 1940s, 50s or so, but they're actually a lot older than that, aren't they? Well, after the Civil War, Americans started cutting down trees and putting them in houses, and people in cities became really convinced that all of the pine trees in the, in the United States were going to be cut down. So they started making artificial trees to sell. By 1880, you could buy a feather tree that was purple or pink or red. And obviously, we haven't run out of Christmas trees, living ones. Christmas tree farms now uh, represent not only an industry, but also represents, I think, the best of the holiday season if we remember the Christian roots of the tree itself. Lori, it's that special time of the year. It sure is, Bill. We want you and your loved ones to know that you are in our hearts this holiday season. Yeah, and if you are on our mailing list, you can expect to receive two special Christmas ornaments. Take a moment, write your prayer request on the back of the ornament and return it in the envelope we'll provide, and we'll display the ornament at the studio on our Tree of Hope as we pray for your specific needs. And the other ornament is for you to place on your own Christmas tree as a reminder that we are praying for you. Merry Christmas from all of us here at the 700 Club Canada. Merry Christmas. Well, you heard earlier on in the show, Bill talking about Psalm 23, this beautiful Psalm of David that just actually teaches us so much about ourselves and our tendency as sheep and the way God actually interacts with us. Well, we have a great resource for you called The Lord is My Shepherd, the Psalm of David. It is a rich teaching on that Psalm. Well, how do you get this? All you have to do is become a 700 Club Canada monthly partner with us. Start at $20 a month or more and join the mission and the vision here of 700 Club Canada to reach more people with the beautiful news of who God really is. So give us a call, one 855 759 700 and become a partner with us today. It's the most memorized passage in the Psalms. The Psalm that I learned as a child in Sunday school. The Lord is my shepherd. Now, what happens when we fully embrace the Lord is my shepherd? The Christian Broadcasting Network presents a profound new teaching by Gordon Robertson. The Lord is my shepherd, a Psalm of David. This is a guide for every pilgrim, every Christian as you go through life. In this brand new teaching, you'll discover the path to true provision when the most troubling situations can work for good, the key to claiming victory over your battles. Plus, learn how to hear God's voice and experience His presence. It's a psalm of how you overcome struggles. Get this encouraging new teaching, The Lord is My Shepherd, a Psalm of David, available now.
Well, we've been enjoying this time of Advent together, and today we want to focus on the candle of peace. And I love this candle. I love this reminder, Bill, that really Advent is anticipation of this event, this coming, right? Right. And when the angels show up in the story, yes. right? This magnificent chorus of angels, what do they say? Peace, peace on, on earth. earth. That is their announcement. They announce peace. Well, what's fascinating about that, though, too, is that you would think that we think peace is the cessation of external conflict. Right. So again, you can understand why the first century Jews expected Jesus to overthrow the Romans, because right. in their mind, that was the antithesis, that was the right. opposite of peace. Right. But this peace proclaimed was something that would happen inside yeah. out, not outside in. And that's the difference of Christmas. That is it. And the word peace, the Greek word, Irene, which is actually shalom, right? Yes. The shalom peace is this peace that happens inside of us. That's it's right. actually Jesus himself not just coming as a baby, not just coming to give his life, not just promising to return again, but that Jesus would live inside of us. Hmm. Well, I love that because Advent also is anticipation. So as followers of Christ, here's what we believe. Jesus came to bring us peace inside yeah. the first time by dying for our sins, setting us free, giving us hope. And he's coming a second time to actually bring the external peace that they expected right. the first time. Right. But we couldn't experience the external peace until we had the internal yeah, peace. Yeah. So that's what is so cool about this. No matter what we're going through, yeah. we can have peace today because yeah. God lives in us. In us. And in this waiting time, this mm. time between really the first Advent and the second one, we can wait with peace. We can pray and have confidence that God came through on his promise the first time. He's going to come through mm. again. I love it. And that's the peace he gives. Well, and so it's Christmas season. Don't look at the chaos you see around you. Don't ask God to maybe still the storm outside, although he may do that. Ask him to bring that yeah. deeper peace inside out and then be that peace in the midst of conflict. Yes. That's what it means to be a Christ ambassador. So. And here's the announcement from Luke 2, 14. Huh. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Mm. Live in peace today and yes. enjoy the peace that God hmm. it brings. Well, here's artist Terry Posthumus with his original Advent song, hmm. Prince of Peace. Contact us, visit 700club.ca. On the next 700 Club Canada, a man walks again after praying for a Christmas miracle, and an act of obedience helps one woman find financial freedom. 